Welcome on Texas Football. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by C.J. Vogel. Uh, this is going to be the defensive section uh, of the uh, talk about the Texas Longhorns recruiting class. We previewed the offensive section actually on Tuesday uh, because we knew all the offensive players that were going to be in the, in the class. The defense had some late additions to it, so we want to reserve that uh, until today. Uh, let's start up front, C.J., uh, and talk about those that group and then talk about the edge guys the sole linebacker in the class, Ty Anthony Smith, and then uh, segue into uh, the secondary. Uh, and I really want to do it in a way that talks about fitting the needs of what Steve Sarkeesian said in the press conference, because that's what the head coach is talking about uh, when he gets into this. Uh, let's start really up front with the big uglies, Bo Davis's guys. Uh, Alex January uh, out of Duncanville, 6'5", 320 or so. Uh, DeAndre Robinson out of Orlando Jones. Uh, six, three and a half, 300 plus. Uh, and then Melvin Hills, a uh, big ball of clay almost out of Lafayette Christian uh, Academy. Th those three guys are the three interior guys. Now they still make try to take one or more. We've talked about that, whether it be D. Allen Evans out of Longview Pine Tree, uh, Dominic McKinley out of Lafayette as well, or uh, Alex Foster out of Greenville, Mississippi. But let's talk about the three that they got. And I want you to start with uh, Alex January, young man, out of Duncanville, if you don't mind. Tremendous motor, tremendous hands. Uh, there's a lot to like about Alex January, obviously being on the same uh, defensive line at Duncanville with Colin Simmons. In a way, he gets overshadowed because you look at Colin Simmons and the five stars and the production that he's had, you get lost in a little bit of what Alex January also brings to the table. Though if you watch that state title game, it was Alex January who was really – uh, probably the more dominant player early on until North Shore really had to go to that passing attack later on in the game. I love Alex January, and he comes from a baseball background. Obviously, his father played at Texas on the defensive line as well. 6'5", 320. It's only a matter of time before Bo Davis gets his hands on him. Obviously, he's going to slim down, but he's going to build back up with good weight. You know, some of that weight that you can only get in a Tory Becton strength and conditioning program. So that's exciting. He certainly fits that mold of being a true nose, like we've seen with Tavondre Sweat. And I think that's certainly what you want right now with uh, with Alex January. All right. So let's talk about DeAndre Robinson and Melvin Hills. And then we're going to grade how we think Bo Davis and the Longhorns did meeting their needs. DeAndre Robinson out of Orlando Jones. I think you and I both like his upside a lot. Yeah, definitely. I think this is one of those guys who really hasn't seen a whole lot of development in his game. It's going more off of just pure strength and will uh, to tackle football players. And so I, I think this is a guy who has probably the highest ceiling of the bunch right now. Uh, again, what we see on film is great. There's a lot of production. There's a lot of aggression and violence. It's what you want for a very raw defensive uh, defensive tackle. But remember, he's very raw. And similarly to January, I think this is a guy who fits at the nose position uh, already 300 plus. I think this is a guy who gets about 325 during his playing days at Texas. But it's all about development for him. Uh, you, Bobby, you mentioned the take and bait kind of situation. I think this is a, a candidate for that, especially we'll see him down the road in his Texas career. But again, the ceiling is there. It's probably the highest of. Anybody on the defense, not named Colin Simmons, I think. Uh, but it, it, it could take some time to get to that point. All right. Uh, Melvin Hills, the other guy out of Lafayette, Louisiana, Lafayette, Louisiana, Lafayette Christian. The thing I like about him, CJ, and, and one thing that uh, Sark brought up in his uh, presser on Wednesday, he was talking about how they had him in camp and they didn't want to pass on him. They liked him enough in camp after Bo Davis worked with him and said, hey, let's let's grab him and make sure he's part of this class. He was not as heavily recruited as the other two. I think Texas beat out Ole Miss for him. Uh, but Texas wanted him, and, and Bo Davis, you know, it's hard to it's hard to debate Bo Davis's uh, track record of development. All right, let's talk about all three of those guys as a group. I mean, coming in, we knew Texas wanted three to four defensive tackles because, frankly, Alfred Collins, uh, Byron Murphy, and, uh, and, of course, Tavondre Sweat, all leaving the Longhorns, we believe, after the season. They wanted three to four in this class. They got three, and they're still looking for a fourth. I think they did really, really well here. I mean, given that there, wasn't, or there weren't a lot of big-time defensive tackles in state, I mean, literally, Alex January is the only one in state that they offered. Um, and so 
Uh, given that fact, I think they actually filled their needs really, really well, and they still have you know meat left on the hook. No, 100%. Like you said, Bobby, this is one of the biggest points we'll see throughout this entire class. In-state recruiting at the defensive tackle position has not always been a, you know, a, a position of riches in the state of Texas. And so for, for Bo Davis and the Texas staff to go out of state into SEC territory twice to grab defensive linemen, very encouraging. I think this is at a spot right now where you're looking at like an A minus with the potential to go to A plus, because like you said, they wanted three to four. They've got three. And I think they've got three very good ones, all with good high upsides, all with great raw tools. If you can go out of Dalen Evans and Alex Foster or even a Dominic McKinley, that shoots the ceiling of your class through the roof. And, uh, you know, like you said, there's going to be a lot of uh, talent, experience, production that needs to be replaced. This is how you do it. Stock in the shelves to ensure that you always have talent available for you. Yeah, I, I think that, that they definitely if, if you're giving me a yes or no on this. I put a check next to the yes on that. Group. Yeah. All right. I, let's talk about uh, the, the edges because, you know, nobody was more recruited in this class than Colin Simmons. But I want to start with Zena Umiozulu because I think he's kind of the forgotten. He can be the forgotten guy in some ways, even though he shouldn't be. Um, he's a very talented young man. Uh, one of the best looking prospects Texas brings in in the entire recruiting class. Uh, we know he's, he, he can be that dominant player. He's been moved around a couple of different times. Uh, CJ, uh, Zena is interesting, 6'4", all of it, 220 pounds. That was on campus uh, a couple months ago. Uh, the Longhorns really, really like his upside. Uh, they like his physique. And, of course, his brother Neto's already on campus. Uh, tell us what you think about him uh, as an edge prospect. Yeah, definitely. The size, the physique, uh, the bend and the length all stand out. 6'4", off the edge, uh, prototypical. You know he's going to add weight because of what we've seen with his brother Nato on the offensive line. And again, like Nato, there's a nastiness to his game. The, the secret to Zena and his development is being able to flip that switch continually and make sure that whenever he's on the field, that he's playing at that motor and that 100% mile per hour uh, approach that Texas likes at their edge position. I like what Steve Sarkeesian said. He's only scratching the surface of what he can potentially be. That's encouraging. I think for a guy that's not necessarily uh, fit or ranked or even expected to play right away, the, the development will be there. There will be time for him to develop. And there's an expectation, as we've seen with NATO, that that's going to happen. You know, So I'm excited for, for Zena. I think, again, he, he's a, a great locker room guy. He's led Allen's workout programs the last two summers. He should be a great fit. Gotcha. Uh, now let's go to this guy. <laughs> he, he needs very little introduction. When we had uh, his announcement on live, we had like 4,500 uh, concurrent listeners and viewers on the on the YouTube show here. Uh, Colin Simmons, uh, one of the state's top prospects, if not the top prospect, the highest rated recruit in the class. Uh, we've talked about him ad nauseum. Uh, we had Fozzie Whitaker on the show this morning uh, on Coffee and Football talking about how he loved the fact how he could bend the edge. Is there really anything more that needs to be said there? You know, I, I think the next step is just seeing it person. You know, all the tools are there. The expectations are high. It's one of those things that now all we have to do is see it roll out in front of you. And for Colin Simmons, I mean, eight tackles, three sacks, you know, a back-to-back state championship MVP on the defensive side of the ball for Duncanville. The accolades are there. The five stars are there. He was that missing piece that Texas desperately needed on that edge spot, and they got him. That, yeah, I agree with you. This is the, the thing about this one uh, for me is that it showed Texas could recruit against the big boys on elite prospects on the defensive side of the ball yeah. on the defensive line. That was the what, that was one of the questions marks of Steve Sarkeesian heading into this recruiting campaign. People don't remember that, but that was a that was a legitimate question. So again, a yes or no? Did they do it? Yeah, yeah. it's this one's an easy answer. Now, Ty Anthony Smith at linebacker is a little bit different because the Longhorns took five linebackers a year ago. Uh, they only really went after two guys, two or three guys. Ty Anthony Smith is one of them from Jasper uh, and Justin Williams out of Conroe Oak Ridge, the other. Well, Oak Ridge, uh, Justin Williams committed to, to Georgia relatively early. Ty Anthony Smith committed to A&M back in the summer. But over time, 
as we've talked about, Steve Sarkeesian and his group decided to stay with the whole process. Uh, and, you know, in the end, after a coaching change, fortuitous, they stayed with their guy. They didn't back away. After a coaching change, Ty Anthony Smith becomes uh, a commitment to Texas on Wednesday night, signing with the Longhorns. Uh, you know, how do you feel Texas fit uh, in this process at the linebacker position, CJ? Is this enough? Was one player enough? Or is this the guy you wanted to get if you were only going to take one? I think it's a, a testament to the complementary recruiting we're seeing with Texas at each position through, you know, multiple cycles. Obviously, you know, it, the, the the offensive line is the best spot you can go to and point to. You know, Texas needed offensive line, and they go get seven. Then they get six, and then they get three, but there's a five-star in the mix. Last year, Texas goes out, and they grab five linebackers. There's a five-star in the mix. There's, a you know, multiple guys that are – uh, versatile and highly recruited as well when it comes to uh, Jelani McDonald and Darren Gallet in that mix, obviously Leonga LaFowle as well. Uh, there wasn't necessarily a, a, a big need at the linebacker spot this cycle, so it allowed them to be selective. It allowed them to step back and say, you know, if we do take someone, we know it's going to be one of these two or three guys. They ended up with one of those two or three guys and Ty Anthony Smith with the late flip. It's great. It's Again, I like taking a guy each position, each cycle, and if you you know, have to settle for one, and it just happens to be Ty Anthony Smith, you're getting a heck of a ball player right there. Got it. Uh, let's move to what I think was, even though Colin Simmons and the defensive tackles and Cena and all those guys look good, I think the marquee position of this entire class, for me, is the secondary. Yeah. I mean, when, when Terry Joseph and Blake Gideon put their head on the pillow on Wednesday night, they, they probably slept pretty well. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think that's the best way to put it. Uh, you look around at what they've done, uh, and uh, it really it, it got started with Santana Wilson. So I want to start there. That's a young man uh, out of Arizona that, CJ, you and I both like a lot. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the NFL pedigree is something that I've continued to mention about Santana Wilson. Just being around football as long as he has uh, is exciting to me because you're going to know the game at the cornerback position. You're going to be aware of, you know, you know zone coverages, route concepts, Everything along the lines of that. And then on, on the film, I mean, he's a ball hawk. He gets after it. Uh, he's always around the football, even though I think it's probably smarter at the high school race to not target him. Uh, I, it's in, it's encouraging because that's, you know, one of those big question marks. You know, when are Texas cornerbacks really going to go uh, become big interception numbers? And I think we're going to see that with Terrence Brooks and Malik Muhammad. But if you can continue that further, that's what makes great defenses even more special. So, Big fan of Santana Wilson, and I know, Bobby, you're a big fan of his length in terms of the arm length. Uh, speak on that because that's also a big piece of what makes great cornerbacks. Yeah, it, it's not just him. That I think that's the tie that binds almost everybody in the secondary that Texas took. Uh, they, they they wanted longer arm guys, uh, and that doesn't mean that you can't play. I mean, Quandre Diggs doesn't have long arms, right? <laughs> I mean, you could be a great player. The point being – you know, they wanted more of that in the secondary, more length to deal with, I think, getting off of blocks, for example. Uh, that's one of the things that Ryan Watts actually does really well because he's got it, – it, it's one of those things. I also want to mention this, and this is a guy – there are other guys in this class that we clearly like. Uh, another leader of the class, I think, is Jordan Johnson Rubel. Yes. Uh, young man's originally from, from Fort Worth but spent the last couple of years at IMG Academy – he is, and, it, and Rob Babers like to say it, he thinks he's kind of that five-tool guy. He might be able to play a little safety, a little nickel, kind of move him around a little bit, has a high football IQ. Uh, you talk to the guys uh, at IMG, CJ, and I just think that they think he's a baller. Uh, they, don't, they, they think he may be one of the better players on the team. He may not be one of the better or the best prospect, you know, because they're, they're, they're from the land of, uh, you know, perfect – perfect guys that they're choosing from around the country, uh, but five, nine and a half, 170 pounds. Uh, but he comes up and hits you. I think that Jordan Johnson rebel is a possibility to, to see not necessarily early playing time, but a little bit like, I don't know, Warren Roberson, mm -hmm. where you know that he's just got a little something in him. That's going to, that's going to end up coming out and, and playing a real part of it. Now I want to go to this next guy uh, and that's Wardell Mack and get your feelings on him. Uh, because you talk about long levers and all this other stuff. He's originally committed to Florida. He and Xavier Filsimi 
both originally committed to Florida, but again, Texas stuck after it, uh, and it paid off with this young man from John Eric High School. Yeah, Bobby, you talk about defensive linemen from SEC country. Defensive backs from the boot are always in that conversation for me as well, and I really like Wardell Mack. Uh, very rarely do you see these kids not stick in the state of Louisiana uh, for their college, but to Wardell Mack's credit, it was hard for anybody to, to not want him across the country. Ended up originally committing to Florida. Florida moves on from Corey Raymond, and obviously their season kind of goes down the drain. But with Wardell Mack especially, a guy who right now is not the biggest, but when you watch the film is not afraid to drive downfield and go hit somebody. And I really, really appreciate that in cornerbacks uh, who can also stand back up and, and not get beat deep 30 yards down the field. So a true total package at the cornerback spot. Uh, I think he's a prime posi- or prime candidate to be a field corner later on in his his Texas career. There, you know, could be also a move to the inside as well. I think is a little bit more unlikely though. Uh, field corner is where I see him at the moment. And like you said, lengthy arms, wiry build, and can really really affect uh, the ball in the air whenever he is targeted. Yep, uh, Kobe Black, the other guy uh, that we need to talk about, along with Xavier Filsamy. But uh, Kobe Black is a cornerback. Strong player, played multiple positions in high school. Uh, CJ, I think he's a, a guy that Texas identified early in the process, stuck with it. And you know what? Even though he didn't commit until a week ago yesterday, it felt like he was committed to Texas almost all season long. Yeah, definitely. You know, following that that June official visit, uh, while he was still being recruited by schools across the country, it was Texas that really was in that top pole position, and it never wavered after that. Uh, Sarkeesian made an interesting comment that I think is is something that, you know, hit the nail on the head when it comes to Kobe Black. He plays three positions. You know, he can play cornerback. He can play safety. He can play nickel. Wherever you need him in the secondary because of his versatility and his athleticism, he can fit the, that, that role and he can be molded into that kind of uh, defensive back. Uh, there's also, you know, close to him playing offense. He is that well-rounded that he can do just about anything you want on a football field. And I'm very excited to see him. Uh, I do think, you know, kind of the traits that he has currently, a move towards the back end of the secondary, you know, could be in the the future. Uh, But preferably, you know, he's a guy that that will stand around there all the time and say, you know, I'm I'm a DB. I'll play everything. I'll play everything. I think that's a great approach. I'll, you know, stay out of that small box, if you will. Yep, absolutely. The other guy that they added in the high school ranks, Xavier Filsamy. Uh, probably the biggest news of signing day week, his flip from Florida. Uh, long anticipated, but unknown if he would do it. And then mm-hmm. on Monday night, or Monday afternoon, excuse me, he makes the decision to go ahead and uh, choose Texas. Uh, another tie that binds in this group is speed, right? And he may be the prime, uh, most prime example of it, a 10.55 or 10.52, 100-meter time to his credit, fully automated. Um, big, big pickup for Texas. And I think kind of, uh, I don't want to say the cherry on top because it's just one of those guys that, you know what, uh, Texas, this guy could be a three-year starter at Texas and potentially a seven to 10 year guy in the NFL, because he just has all of those it factors that you look for CJ. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, I think Sarkeesian put it best in his press conference. The kid was born to be a DB. And very rarely are you able to to look at a kid out of high school and say, yep, don't even need to bother, uh, you know, wondering where he'll fit in at the next level because this guy is going to be a defensive back. Uh, He can run. He can hit. He has the physicality. I think he's above average in in coverage as well, which is encouraging because you can certainly improve on that. And when you have the speed, it makes that learning curve just a little bit easier because you can – catch up and, and 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 close in on distances just that much quicker and, and easier. So uh, Xavier feels to me coming from that McKinney defense as well. It's one of those things. You either play physical in that defense or you don't play at all. And that on top of being a physical uh, DB through and through kind of approach with Xavier feels to me is certainly encouraging. And like you said, one of the bigger uh, – flips one of the bigger moments of the national signing day uh lead up was Xavier for me Xavier Phil Simi's, you know commitment to Texas so look at all the positions the, the, at DB they took five high school players and um I think that they knew they had I mean they had three portal guys just from just from safety alone this offseason right? uh then you have two guys graduating as well from the position they had to go heavy safety 
Uh, they needed new blood at corner. They lost a, a guy to the portal there as well. Um, and they needed to upgrade talent overall. And I think, look, if I'm sitting there looking at it, I, I'm not so sure they didn't get the best defensive back class in the country. So I would say check plus or check plus plus. But then I'm going to add this guy, Andrew Makuba, <laughs> the yeah. uh, out, out of uh, out of Austin's LBJ High School. Look, I mean, that that's another one that is a three-year starter at a major conference program. And so you add him to that mix. And I just think that Texas is going to be looking at, and Rob Baber said this. He goes, I think that the DBs has been the last thing to catch up to Texas and Steve Sarkeesian. Hasn't been necessarily edge or defensive line. It's been those those uh, DBs that's the last to catch up. Well, I think this group's going to catch up. That, that, that's what it's going to be. Yeah, 100%. And Makuba, like you said, the experience, great. More on top of that, the versatility. And I think that's kind of a recurring theme that we've seen with this five uh, DB group as well. They can play multiple spots, you know, and, and they all have that similar skill set to say, you know, if, you, if you're not working out at nickel, you can go to safety. If you're not working at safety, you can go to nickel. If you're at nickel, you know, go out wide and play cornerback as well. That's so encouraging uh, for Blake Gideon and Terry Joseph to, to be able to locate that kind of talent and obviously get them to, to buy into the Texas program and commit. All right. The last guy we want to mention is, is this, and that's Michael Kern, young man out of St. Thomas Aquinas in Fort Lauderdale. I had somebody text me and say, make sure you mention Michael Kern. Uh, I think it was a family member. Uh, that is not why I'm doing it. I'm actually doing it because I consider him part of the defense. Uh, if you don't think Ryan Sanborn pinning people in deep this year wasn't important or Michael Dixon during his time on the 40 acres wasn't important, uh, that's not. That's just not how it does. I heard somebody talk about how Bill Belichick, if he knows that somebody can help him win on fourth down, he's definitely going to be, be a, a guy that they look at. And so that's what Michael Kern's job will be uh, with the Texas Longhorns. All right, uh, one of the top five uh, punting prospects in the country, uh, Steve Sarkeesian said he thought he was the best in the country on signing day. All right, that's going to do it. That's the defensive breakdown for signing day. Uh, this is uh, actually we taping it on Thursday because Ty Anthony Smith uh, committed late yesterday, and uh, CJ and I had a busy day yesterday. But, uh, look, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll be back with more football theory coming up later today uh, with Rod Babers and Coach Bob Shipley. For CJ Vogel, I'm Bobby Burton. Welcome.